Welcome everyone. I am Melissa Joy and so pleased to have you joining us for the investment and economic update. I am thrilled to be joined by Hannah Neer and Jay Freidenberg, who you'll be hearing from shortly. And as we're getting started, just a couple of housekeeping announcements. We're going to spend 30 to 45 minutes talking about markets. We're going to try to make it real world conversation and language. And in the end, I'm really excited to just share with you kind of perspectives that we share with clients all the time about how to think about what's going on right now for the long term and for your investment portfolio. I think it's going to be a great discussion. But we would love if you have any questions for you to put them in, submit them. We've already got some questions for the pre-registration teed up to answer. And um, we'd love to hear from you. If you have particular things you want to talk about, you can just put them in the Q&A. Um, so as we get started, um, I will just remind you who our co-hosts are. You'll be seeing their faces shortly. Um, Jay Freidenberg from our Gross Point office and Hannah Neer, who works with our clients around the country and is based out of Charlevoix. And um, our agenda is to give you a quick perspective on a very interesting first quarter of the markets and start to the year. We're going to be talking economy. What would um, a recent economic discussion be without talking about inflation? And then we're going to talk about how that has impacted stock and bond returns. Um, so Hannah will take over the economy, and then Jay's going to talk about markets and investing, and then I will wrap it up with where to go from here. And just to let you know, I'm talking from home today, feeling a little under the weather, but I was so excited to talk about that last part that when Jay and Hannah offered to take over my portion, I was like, no, I'll rally for this part. So I'm excited actually to talk about this geeky stuff. So as we get started, I just want to mention um, that you may feel gloomy about how investments are, especially after having lived through last year, which was just a gut punch, whether you're a stock investor, a bond investor, or as many of our clients are both. But this year was a, a market turn so far. The markets ended 331 um, at the end of March, up 7%, and they're up even higher um, since then. Even though they are up, and you can see that on the black line on the far right, um, you can see that we've had a pullback of as much as 8% even so far this year. So it's not without volatility. Um, but if you were to tick down all types of investments, where whether it's bonds, gold, um, international stocks, um, growth stocks, even value stocks, all of them um, are markedly positive. So um, you might feel gloomy, but the investment returns aren't feeling gloomy so far this year, if you were to measure by the year. And I think that is a good context for us to hand it off to Hannah. Let's talk economy, Hannah. Okay. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, so as Melissa mentioned, I am going to talk a little bit about the general state of the economy, as well as touch on inflation and the Fed's reaction to inflation. Um so as Melissa kind of showed on that chart, um, you probably remember last year, early last year, we were kind of experiencing those market record highs. Um, and since then, of course, we've seen rough periods for both the stock and the bond market. Um, the Fed basically went from not even considering raising interest rates to raising at the fastest pace in almost four decades. Um, and the reason I wanted to bring this up is it's just a really good reminder for all of us that the markets are ever changing and they don't always behave the way we would expect in the short term. So that being said, historically, um, bear market declines on average have lasted about 16 months. Um, we are currently at the 15 month mark um, for the current bear market. So we're essentially hitting the average as of right now. And similarly, if we look at the historic length of a Fed tightening cycle, they've lasted about 13 months. Bond markets, on the other hand, have historically seen average declines lasting about three months. And of course, um, as most of us know, um, we're far beyond that average timeline for bond declines currently. So all of this being said, um, although we cannot predict the market behavior in the short term, um, based on historical averages, we feel that we're closer to the end of a Fed tightening cycle than the beginning. So if we move on to the next slide here, um, let's take a look at how um, consumer spending is impacted by the overall economy. So in this first chart, 
um, we can see that overall consumer goods spending has continued to decelerate since um, the beginning of 2022, or that market peak that we talked about happening very early last year. And then when we break down consumer spending by category, we can see that consumers are spending more on goods um, that could be considered necessities, um, food, car, home repair, auto parts, um, discretionary items like going out to eat or vacationing has slowed a little bit over the past year. Um, so if we jump forward to the next slide, um, those spending patterns make a lot of sense when we consider kind of the overall state of where we are as an economy. Consumers are really spending less, or excuse me, saving less than they have historically. Um, the savings rate right now is sitting at right around 5%. Um, and also, a lot of folks were able to build up a little bit of savings during those pan those pandemic times. And unfortunately, um, a lot of those same people have been spending from their savings in subsequent years, um, just due to the increased cost of living. So we can also see that with interest rates moving higher, it's becoming less appealing or even cost prohibitive to carry debt. Um, so because of this, we do expect that overall debt levels will start to decline slightly or at least slow their pace. Um, and this falls right in line with the previous slide. Essentially, any discretionary items that may have required financing are kind of taking a back, um, a back burner approach for many consumers just due to the cost of borrowing. Um, and then finally on this slide, the percentage of households who are unable to obtain credit is at a record high um, actually over the past decade. So this is, of course, going to have an impact on um, discretionary spending, such as vacations and, um, you know, items that you don't need for um, necessity purposes. So moving on, um, we also wanted to consider kind of some of the data behind the overall consuming spending numbers. So job creation is, of course, um, pretty highly correlated to consumer spending power. And a lot of analysts right now believe that job creation is going to slow down in this upcoming year. And some analysts even believe that we'll drop into negative territory um, as far as job creations go starting in July of this year. So this can feel a little bit surprising just given um, we have had some strong job data reports that have come out so far this year, um, but we do think there might be a little bit of a disconnect between um, the actual government data on the job growth versus underlying trends that we're seeing in the economy. Um, I know in, a, in headlines we've seen lately, there are um, you know, some significant layoffs that are taking place, particularly in the tech sector. Um, but we are starting to see layoffs kind of extend beyond the tech industry, um, particularly the professional placement agencies have started to see an uptick in layoffs. And then we've also seen um, companies like McDonald's and Walmart start um, some rounds of layoffs as well. So overall, we don't expect severe or widespread layoffs on an economy, a full-blown economy level, but we do believe um, that the decline in jobs will be mild. And when we look historically at average employment recessions, we've seen the economy lose about 2 million jobs. Um, based on current numbers right now, we're only expecting to lose about 500,000 jobs this year. Um, and some analysts expect even less. So we don't expect this to be um, severe or widespread by any means, but it is just something we're wanting to keep um, in the back of our mind. So next, we'll move on to this slide, um, just kind of recap our views on the overall economy. Um, an employment decline, although it is expected to be mild, is one of the reasons that we think the market might continue to experience a little bit of turbulence this year. Um, the unemployment rate is expected to tick up to about 4.7% in this upcoming year. Again, not a major concern, but just something to keep on our radar. And we also like to look at GDP or gross domestic product as a measure of economic growth. And um, for anyone that might need a refresher, um, GDP is basically the standard measurement of the value created uh, through the productions of goods and services in our country, essentially um, a capture of our country's economic output. 
So analysts are anticipating the potential for two subsequent quarters of negative GDP growth this year. Um, and it's important to remember that historically, the average length of a recession is about 12 months. So even if we do experience some dips in GDP output, we don't expect it to drop us um, into full-blown recession territory. Okay, so moving on to the next slide here, um, let's talk a little bit about monetary policy and the Fed's goal of cooling inflation, um, which as Melissa mentioned is everyone's favorite topic right now. Um, and I know we mentioned earlier in the pre presentation, but it is really important to kind of consider some historic perspectives when we're talking about uh, the Fed tightening cycle. So if we look at this first chart um, here, we are quickly reminded that this particular Fed tightening cycle is by leaps and bounds the fastest and most significant increase in interest rates over the past 40 years. Um, so then when we look at consumer reaction to the Fed raising interest rates, we can historically see the full impact of those interest rate hikes kind of lags about a year behind. So the actual impact that the economy is going to feel lags by about one year. So when we think about why this might be, we have to consider kind of the length of time it takes for consumers or businesses to decide to postpone or even decide against buying something um, due to the cost of financing. And then if we consider the impact of the Fed raising interest rates from this perspective, um, the economy is only just now kind of starting to feel some of those impacts of those first um, small hikes that we experienced last year. So we expect that the interest rate hikes that have already taken place may begin to feel a little bit more impactful to consumers this year. Um, however, um, the good news is that we do think that we are nearing the end of a Fed tightening cycle. Um, a lot of analysts think that interest rates will hike, or excuse me, will peak around 5.25%, and um, that this peak may arrive in the upcoming May meeting. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about whether the Fed's tightening um, of interest rates has kind of made an impact on the overall on overall inflation. So one of the things that we think the one of the reasons that we think the Fed is close to being done with those interest rate hikes is that there's a lot of evidence that inflation has flattened or even started to decline. So on the left here, um, we can see that each of the major components of disinflationary factors um, have seen declines in, in prices, um, specifically freight, egg prices, um, the cost of goods, lumber, oil. Um, a lot of these particular sectors um, of the economy were kind of in the forefront of, of the news in previous months as being um, the primary areas where consumers really felt the inflationary pressure. Um, so this is really good news that these prices have begun to slow and is really encouraging. Um, the second chart on the right here does a really great job of kind of showing this meeting point between declining infl inflation, which is shown there in purple, and then the rising um, fund Fed rate shown in orange. And we've kind of been referring to this chart as kind of the meeting in the middle. And um, with inflationary pressures declining, we anticipate seeing at least a slowdown when it comes to rising interest rates. So on this next slide, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the housing market. Um, as would be expected, higher interest rates have kind of put more pressure on the housing market activity levels. Um, and of course, as a result, sales have slowed. So mortgage applications have actually fallen to the lowest level we've seen since 1997. And we've also started to see the housing prices um, in the top 20 US cities start to fall a little bit. So um, all of that is disclaimed by saying, um, although the national average of home prices is down from its peak by about 5.1%, prices are actually still up year over year in 16 of those top 20 cities. Um, and then this chart on the right shows us home prices throughout the year for each of the last four years. And um, while housing prices may be down again, you know, from the record high last June, they are still higher than they were this time last year. And even more importantly than that, um, they're 
37% higher than they were in 2020, just prior to the pandemic. So whether you've been shopping the housing market or you're just kind of tracking the value of your own home, um, I think most of us have definitely felt this increase in home prices over you know, the past three years or so. Um, so the small decline in housing is by no means a crash, uh, but we would consider it to be kind of a softening, so to speak. Um, and we do not expect significant declines to continue to unfold, um, assuming the Fed does not over tighten. So lastly, I wanted to touch a little bit on the recent banking sector concerns. Um, I know we're not too far removed at this point from um, Silicon Valley Bank bankruptcy. Um, so this is really at the top of mind for many of us as investors. And from a really high level perspective, um, the banks that went under were really a result of asset and liability mismanagement. And this particular issue was also expedited by the rising interest rate environment, um, which, long story short, impacted the long-term treasuries that the banks had on their balance sheets. So certain banks were more prone to feeling the impacts of, of those interest rate changes than others, and particularly banks in the technology space like SVB. Um, however, the recent banking sector concerns are not like those of the great financial crisis back in 2008. Um, the 2008 banking crisis was a result of plethora of factors, but primarily core lending standards. And we don't have those same concerns or believe that we're in the same position today overall um, with, when it comes to the banking sector. Um, and then in addition, the government's reaction to SVB and a handful of other banks filing bankruptcy was really swift. Um, and in general, um, a lot of people considered that to be a confidence builder when it came to our overall banking infrastructure. Um, and that action was really intended to kind of ease consumer concern um, when it comes to trusting our banking system. So with that, I will pass it back over to Jay, and he is going to discuss um, some of those ins and outs when it comes to the stock and bond market. Uh, thank you very much, Hannah. Great Great job, as always. Um, as, as Hannah said, I, I'm going to talk about the bond market and the stock market. I'm going to do a, a brief review of where we've, where, where we've come from. And, and then more importantly, we're, I'm going to talk about what we see and how we think the, uh, the bond and the stock market is going to proceed moving forward. So let's jump right in with the, uh, with the bond market. What we're looking at here is the, uh, the Bloomberg. It's an index that tracks the bond market going back to 1976. Uh, hopefully what jumps out uh, uh, from this chart is that, you know, over 47 years, 42 of the years have uh, produced positive returns for the bond market. Um, what, what may be a little bit more subtle is the, uh, but, but nonetheless incredibly important, is that in each and every year um, represented by the, uh, by the red uh, dots, is that in each and every year at some point during the year, uh, the bond market was negative. I think equally or maybe more important is that in each of the years following a, a negative performance year, the bond market has produced significantly uh, positive returns. Um, so Hannah did a great job talking about um, inflation and the Fed's reaction to that, and um, and then the stock. Uh, I'm sorry, the bond market last year was down 13 percent. And true to form, this is early, but what we're seeing on the very far side of this uh, far right side of this chart is the bond market already starting to recover. So let's dig a little deeper into that with the next slide. Um, what we're looking at here is, is high quality bonds. We're, we're looking at municipal debt, investment grade debt, and, um, and emerging market debt. So what that drawdown or the negative uh, performance of the bond market last year uh, created was, was tremendous value in in the uh, in the bond market across the board, but specifically for uh, for high quality bonds like munis and investment grade and uh, and emerging markets. So, what what has happened historically, and what is already starting to take place, is not just the high yields, and we're going to um, we're going to dig deeper 
into uh, yield compensation, but the capital appreciation that takes place after those negative years. So if you if you take a quick look at the uh, the chart on the right, you'll see in in the um, the blue um, rectangles is the performance last year. Um, but looking to the uh, the light blue uh, rectangles, that's that uh, that recovery that we're already seeing. And more importantly, if you look at the uh, the light gray uh, rectangle, that is the average performance of the uh, high quality bond market one year after the uh, Fed's final rate hike. Uh, Hannah mentioned that most analysts and strategists believe that. Uh, inflation has come down to a point where the Federal Reserve will finish raising rates next month, uh, another uh, quarter of percent or, or, or 0.25 percent. Um, and we look forward to that capital appreciation. But what I want to talk about next is that yield compensation that we're getting, um, because that's not guaranteed, right? I mean, we we think that's going to happen. And again, most uh, most strategists and analysts believe the Fed will be done, but we're being compensated to wait for that. Uh, what I want to draw your attention to is the chart on the uh, on the left. Uh, what this represents is just how much yields have changed in a very short period of time. If you look at the uh, the blue rectangles, these are maturities uh, for Treasuries, and the uh, and the um, the diamonds are where yields are now. Uh, drawing your attention to uh, the three month treasury, three years ago, that was 0.1%, uh, where it is now today at about 4%, that's obviously very significant. And again, that's true across all maturities. You look at the 10 year treasury, three years ago, that was 0.7%, and today it's about 3.6%. So we're looking forward to getting that capital appreciation once the Federal Reserve is done raising rates, but we're being compensated uh, to own bonds uh, now and uh, look forward to that, uh, that capital appreciation. One final point I want to make on this is that it's not just over the last three years, it's been over the last 10 years. If you look at the chart on the right, uh, the current yields are in the middle of that. I mentioned the 10-year treasury at 3.6%. 95% of the time over the last 10 years, that's been higher than the average of 2.2%. Now, Melissa said that we're not going to talk jargon, but I, I, I will mention uh, an acronym that you may have heard. I mention it only because we'll, we'll never have to hear it again, or at least for, for a long time. It's TINA, uh, and that stands for there is no, uh, no other alternative, and that referred to the very low yields that we were receiving in bonds. Well, that is no longer the case. Bonds are uh, um, compensating us to own them now, and we look forward to that capital appreciation when the Fed is finally done raising rates. So I'm going to shift to uh, the stock market. Um, we're looking at the S&P 500 index as a proxy for the, uh, the U.S. stock market. What I want to point out, maybe it's clear, but uh, the cycles are uh, short and severe bear markets, followed by long appreciation in bull markets. We can see that um, the, the current bear market, um, as we all know, last year, uh, more than likely, what I, what I want to get to, and we, we certainly do not try to time or ever advocate for, uh, for timing markets, but we look at fundamentals and probability to a forma, inform us and give us confidence that more than likely the next bull market has already started. So we're going to get into some of these uh, probabilities and fundamentals. If uh, Next slide, please. Um, first of all, following peak inflation, um, if you look at the chart on the left-hand side, historically, the market has rallied, the stock market has rallied for 18 months following peak inflation. And if you remember, uh, inflation peaked last June at 9%, 
So we're about halfway through that rally. I think more importantly um, is the probability. The probability is 80% of the time following peak inflation, uh, the stock market has been positive 12 months afterwards. And then one last thing about uh, valuations, um, peak inflation was followed by uh, peak yields. Uh, the yield on the, four, on the 10 year treasury was 4%. And as I said, that's now down to 3.6%. What lower yields allow the stock market to do is expand in valuation. We, we uh, measure valuation by price earnings multiple. So that decline in yields have allowed the stock market to expand in terms of their valuations. Melissa alluded to this, uh, the S&P 500 is up year to date 8%. So we'll uh, just finish this up by, again, probabilities and, um, and fundamentals. I mentioned that most uh, strategists and analysts, and we agree that the Federal Reserve will most likely be done raising rates next month. Historically, after that final rate hike, 12 months later, the S&P 500, the US stock market is up on average 14.5%, 75% of the time. The last thing I wanna point out is that's not just one sector of the US stock market uh, leading the way, it's a very broad based rally. Every sector within the US stock market participates in these rallies and we're seeing that true to form so far this year. Um, so what I wanna talk about now is trends. And once more, we do not advocate for, for um, timing the market. We run or manage diversified portfolios but what we're looking at here, and I think it's very important and sometimes uh, underappreciated, is uh, leadership between the uh, international stock markets and the U.S. stock markets. Um, going back to 1971, it had been the case that about every four years or so, leadership or that trend would reverse. Uh, internationals would lead the U.S., Four years later, the U.S. would lead internationals. But that trend of four years of leadership ended in 2008. And as you can see, from 2008 until last year, the U.S. stock market absolutely dominated international uh, stock markets. Now, we're not sure if that trend has completely reversed, but for the last year and a half, International stocks have actually led uh, U.S. stocks. Now, there's a there's a host of reasons, but four factors are the main reasons for this. Is one, uh, if we can go back, thanks, Melissa. <laughs> um, prior to uh, 2008, or I should say, starting in 2008, we had very low inflation up until last year we had very low rates. In the United States, they were close to zero. In Europe, they were negative. Um, also, uh, valuations. And, and I don't want to imply that the United States is expensive because we don't think it is, but because of that 14-year four, dominance of the US stock market versus international stocks, we believe that international stocks are very inexpensive or very fairly valid or very inexpensive. And the last thing uh, is that uh, the compositions of the two markets, the US stock market has a lot of technology in it, whereas the international uh, stock market has more economically sensitive uh, sectors like financials and energy, industrials. So whereas the global economy and the local economies grow, the international stock market actually grows at one and a half times uh, the US stock market. So these are factors that our investment committee started talking about last year. And in fact, that led us to reduce our, our underweight to international and, and benefit from what may be uh, a trend going forward. So I wanna finish my presentation or my part of the presentation with two of my favorite slides. 
Uh, you, you may have seen what we refer to as a mountain chart like this in the past. Um, what I want to point out, and, and I, you certainly don't need me to tell you this in terms of the volatility that the U.S. stock market or the S&P 500 has experienced over the last 20 years. But what I do want to point out is that volatility is not anything new. Um, you know, if we look at the tech bubble or the the, the re Great Recession or uh, COVID or or the last bear market, they look pretty dramatic. But when you look at Black Monday or the oil crisis, Vietnam post W W post World War II, is the numbers are similar or actually larger. What you what's harder to tell by this chart is that the size of the U.S. stock market is actually 100 times the size of what it was in the 1950s. And that's why that same volatility of those previous four bear markets look like bumps in the road. And that's why I'm excited to show you this next chart, because what we do here is we extrapolate the performance of the U.S. stock market over the last 50 years at 7.4% to the next 50 years. And we are very confident um, that the US stock market will continue to grow like that. Now the path might not be seven and a half percent per year, but in 50 years from now, the size of the US stock market will be 150, 150,000, not 4,100. So what it does is it makes those last four bear markets look like the preceding for bear markets, where they're really just bumps in the road. So investors that can maintain that long-term focus based on their long-term goals and objectives will benefit from the natural growth of the U.S. stock market, and the compounding effects will be certainly more than that 7.4%. So I hope that was useful. Thanks you. Thank you for your uh, time and attention. And Melissa, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Jay. Um, I love that perspective because short term can feel like such a bumpy ride when it comes to stocks. And over time, um, longer term, there's more consistency when it comes to returns. Just like you were talking about, Jay, this is a look at um, any given one year. Looking back over the last 72 years, you can have a huge range of returns, whether you're invested in stocks and green bonds in blue or half and half um, in gray. When you continue to invest, and it's important, this is your decision. This is where we come in and your, your behavior and choices come in. When you continue to invest, if you don't kind of bail out on the market in those worst cases, then you get more consistency of returns. The range of returns comes becomes more positive. And over 10 and 20 years, um, you have huge consistency of making money as you invest in both stocks or bonds or diversified portfolios. A couple of lessons I want to remind you of that we've been talking to clients about over the years. This first or recently, I should say not over. We talk about it all the time, but I think there are some important reminders for recent lessons. This chart illustrates the value of staying invested because I know sometimes when you get to a bad market like last year, you know, the natural tendency is to say, I'm still an investor. I just want to take a break. I want to sit on the sidelines while we have this, uh, this painful experience, and then I'll get back in the market. So if you look at the lines here, all the lines are on top of each other. This is illustrating 2008 and 2009. I remember 2000, March of 2009, which is the low of the market quite well. I was seven months pregnant and I was so excited to um, have a maternity leave because I just didn't want to go to work and talk about how horrible the market was. It was really a painful time to be an investor. And so if people in that March time period had said, you know what, I'm just going to take a break. I'm going to take a year off and then I'll, I'll get back when the volatility is better. Um, then that is the orange line. So you'd still have made a lot of money. Um, over time, you would have sat around with the 100,000 that you'd originally put in um, in 2003, 
um, from 2009 to 2010, um, put money back in the market, and you'd have $422,000 today, having started with $100,000 20 years ago. But if you'd stayed invested and didn't pick the day that the market was going to start to recover and believed in the process, then you'd have about $300,000 more um, in your investment portfolio. You can really pay a tough penalty or price, in this case, 2.9% returns if you have a situation where you um, choose to kind of take a break. Um, and so I wanted to explain that in an up market um, because it's an important reminder that investing is for the long period of time. And it's kind of the agreement that we kind of try to encourage with clients is that you will stay invested and continue to be an investor. You know, the same lesson can be told from 2020. This is the same illustration, but using um, the COVID downfall or um, COVID in, in 2020, just saying you moved to cash only for a month um, when we had uh, at the beginning of the coronavirus again in March. What What is up with March and, and historic market times? Um, but again, that would make a difference in terms of what the money you had in your portfolio today by about $60,000. So we'd like to give these lessons and make them evergreen because they're important reminders, not just when we're having a horrible day in the market. Um, some other important lessons that I think that are always important for reminders and um, it, we just have a quick little video segment here, but you can really feel like you're on a roller coaster when you're an investor. And fortunately, in the modern times, we have emojis to illustrate how we're feeling because that's how often how we communicate nowadays. Um, but I have a feeling that most people are feeling, you know, a little bit closer to that, like anger, puke, prayer kind of emoji um, than a really happy emoji today. And the reality is that we go through this cycle of emotional pain as investors if we're really tied to the performance of our portfolios from day to day. Um, and the successful investor doesn't let that emotion be played out in their portfolios. They make the decision to stick with the process, think long-term, continue to be invested. And whether you're feeling that sweat um, and pain and, or highs and elation um, at market peaks or not, if you can, as a successful investor, keep a straight face or a poker face when it comes to your investing portfolio, that's really a secret sauce to being successful as an investor over time. So take a minute to see where you're feeling as an investor. I know it can feel very uncertain, but when we're talking about years and decades, um, then we have a lot more confidence in the probability. So, you know, an important reminder when it comes to markets is, um, you know, we always kind of jump to the worst case scenario when things are happening. And it's really easy. We're in spring. We just had a beautiful 80 degree weekend here in Michigan. Um, but it's really easy to feel the doom and gloom. And if you look at this cartoon on the left, you can see someone who is in a beautiful day, but looking at you know bad weather on the news or perhaps bad markets and really feeling the pain dressed for just horrible weather. And I think it's so important to remind people, hey, you just went through a really great quarter in the markets. I know you may not feel that way. You may turn on the news and feel like you just, you know, want to give up when it comes to investing. But time and again, investing is an exercise of optimism over pessimism, of growth and possibility, which isn't always easily seen. And don't be like the chart on the right where you're deciding you know, when to start being an investor and thinking, oh, today is not the day because it's too high or today is not the day because things have gone down or I'll just wait for that next pullback. That can be re really be de decision fatigue. And we encourage you to think long-term, use the advice of a financial planner to, like us <laughs> to really um, have that forward thinking look, um, optimism and looking, um, which can really help with your long-term financial results.
So um, I don't see any questions yet. So I'm challenging everyone that's listening um, to plug in some questions, but we're going to go over some pre-questions that we received um, in just a moment. But quick plug, um, I am a contributor to a book called More Than Money, um, which was published last month. And if anybody wants to receive that, that's on um, this call, just send me an email um, at melissa at pearlplan.com and I'll be happy to send you a copy. Send me your address as well. Um, but it was a really fun um, collaboration with a group called the Advisor Growth Community, where we all wrote chapters about what it's like to be in financial planning and investing. So here's some contact details for our company, um, important disclosures for the legal department. And then I know that one of the first questions, and Jay alluded to this, was how are we positioned in terms of our portfolios? And I will mention um, that we have increased our international components. Last year, we took an underweight that we had on bonds because of just the Tina, the horrible, um, the horrible situation when it came to bond outlook, we'd been underweight for a long time. And we actually flipped to being slightly overweight when it comes to bonds. And then we had had very short duration bonds, but we've increased the duration. And duration is just means that we're, we're not as concerned about the next 12 to 36 months interest rate rises. We think that the Federal Reserve will pause at some point, and eventually, if there's perhaps a recession, then the cycle is that they might lower rates. Um, so we've um, raised international. We've also increased smaller companies a little bit, um, and you know we we continue to have exposure to both growth and value. Um, the value really was strong last year, and growth has been a really important component of the returns year to date. So another question that we had in the request, and also several of our clients have been asking us about, in the news, there's been stories about um, de-dollarization. Basically, will parts of the world stop using the dollar? Will they cut the U.S. out of the economy? And we've had almost a century of dominance when it comes to the dollar. So I just wanted to share first a couple headlines. Um, they may look familiar to or, or like headlines that you're seeing on news nowadays, but they're talking about um, this first headline on the top is from 1975. Just to give you perspective, that was the year I was born. It was a long time ago. Um, talking about the same thing. OPEC may cut their link to the dollar. Hasn't happened yet. Um, this next headline is from The Economist in 2004, um, The Disappearing Dollar. This is thematically something that comes up quite a bit. Um, and I just got a newsletter from um, Money Visuals and my friend Ashby Daniels, and he put together this visual on the right talking about the business model of fear mongering. Um, the people that have something to say or the regimes when it comes to de-dollarization include the BRIC governments, Brazil, um, Russia, um, Venezuela, um, governments that have a lot of China, India, um, have a lot of issues with the U.S., um, but they're selling goods and services that are being bought in dollars, so that's a very strong link. Um, none of this conversation thinking that we really don't think the dollar is going to disappear, FYI. Um, but a lot of these conversations uh, yeah. are are related to um, also people that want you to convert to digital currencies like Bitcoin as well. So there's there are some, and then you know if it's the media, if you're watching a show, fear leads to ratings, um, and so that's part of the conversation as well. Jay, I, as you cough, I see. Um, did you want to add anything to that dollar conversation? Sure. I, I mean, I think you did a great job, Melissa, and it, it, and it is so true, whether it's uh, the media selling consumer products and, and trying to benefit from that, that, that fear component of what sells, um, whether it's the, the cryptocurrency world that's, that's trying to convert, or uh, most notably, um, the emerging markets. And, and, and just as you said, I mean, I think these are great visuals that this is, this is not a new conversation. It tends to happen over and over again. Uh, what I wanted to add is um, just some perspective in terms of the size. The uh, the thirty year average for uh, the dollar being the the world currency is fifty uh, percent. 
in 30 years, it's been as high as 70%. Right now, it's 60%. So in order for this to take place, I mean, the whole world market and the whole world economy would, would, would have to undergo a huge dramatic change. And to that change, it just, again, a little bit of perspective, the, the Chinese currency is 3% of the world currency. So compared to 60%, I mean, so much would have to change. And uh, the yuan is um, pegged to the dollar. Their economy is about 25% real estate. And if they were to try to take over the dollar, they would have to de-peg from the dollar, um, which would essentially destroy that component, or I should say in different terms, severely affect that component of their economy. So um, this talk that is nothing new, uh, there is, I shouldn't say no chance, but it's certainly not anytime soon that the US dollar um, will not be the world currency. I mean, you have competing problematic currencies as well that are in the developed trusted currencies um, of the euro and the yen as well. And um, if there's any kind of market share being taken, they're probably coming, the, at least statistically, measurably coming from them. That's not to say that debt isn't like there, there's no pain or payment for having huge amounts of debt. Um, and in fact, I think one of the things we'll have to be discussing on our next call is the debt ceiling because there is um, a very high probability that Washington, D.C. needs to create a crisis in order to kick the can down the road when it comes to the debt ceiling. So, you know, it's likely that there's a solution for that in terms of not having government shut down. Um, but it at least recent history has required basically a standoff when it comes to Washington, D.C. And where that is going to have to happen in the next 60 to 90 days. We know McCarthy, the House Speaker, has presented a potential deal that would um, have a debt ceiling kind of work itself out until the election um, in 2024. Um, we'll see if that comes to be, but you know, there's not a lot of spirit of cooperation when it comes to um, the Capitol. So, you know, we do anticipate there's always going to be, there's always a reason to have that rainy forecast when it comes to looking at markets, but there's also, you know, markets price in things well in advance of you seeing them on the news. Um, and that's what we see from last year. There's a lot of negativity priced in. And when there's more optimistic things happening, you get returns like you did this year. So you guys have all stuck with us. Thank you so much. There's going to be a recording of this um, that we'll have in our next newsletter and send to anyone who um, signed up for the call. And we'll also, it's going to be available on YouTube. So we always encourage you to check out what we have to say. Be in touch if you'd like to have your questions answered individually. And we appreciate everybody that everyone who's listened in. If you have topics that you would like us to be discussing on future webinars, we'd love to hear that as well. And so thanks for joining us on this spring afternoon. We'll see you this summer for an additional economic update. Great job, Jay and Hannah. And many thanks to Melissa Freidenberg who put together the presentation as well. So um, thanks from us and have a great day.